Shalom Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and this is part 12 of our series, The Divinity of Yeshua. We are moving through the scriptures. We are headed now into the prophets. We've spent much time in the Torah, so I encourage you to go back and listen to those teachings. And uh, recently now we have moved into the prophets. Last time together, we were in the book of Judges. And today we are going to be moving into Isaiah. Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 6. So before we begin, though, let's uh, do the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he is the only giver of eternal life. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Natal Lanu at Derech HaYeshua, Mashiach, Yeshua Baruch Hu. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah, Yeshua. Blessed be his name. Amen. Amen. So why don't you go with me if you have your Bibles open or your computers, and I'm going to also have it on the screen here. Let's go to Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 6. Amen. Okay, here we are in Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 6, and we'll go ahead and start with verse 1. I'm going to be reading 1 through verse 10, and it says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Yahweh seated, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Seraphim were standing above him. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face, and with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. One called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Zabuot, Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Then the posts of the door trembled at the voice of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Then I said, this is Yeshayahu, Oi, to me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I am dwelling among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh Zabaot. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken in tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sins atoned for. Then I heard the voice of Yahweh saying, Whom should I send and who will go for us? Notice the us there. So I said, Hinani, here I am, send me. Then he said, Go, tell his people here without understanding and see without perceiving, make the heart of this people fat, their ears heavy and their eyes blind, else they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So here we have some basic um, understanding of this before we dive into the deeper waters of this scripture, and that is it's going to be beneficial for us to see uh, a little bit about King Uzziah because something happens upon his death that triggers this, uh, this vision that Yeshayahu has. And there are several pieces in here that uh, stand out. So after Uzziah's death, now Yeshayahu sees Yahweh seated on the throne. So obviously many people right away will say, well, this is the father. This is Yahweh. He saw Yahweh. It's got to be the father. Okay. Uh, we are going to prove that no, it is actually Yeshua seated on that throne who is Yahweh. Amen. In the uh, first century, of course, there was this theology of the two powers in heaven and there was a thinking of a visible Yahweh and an invisible Yahweh 
They were of that same nature, many Jews believe, not all. There was all this discussion going on because the fullness of that revelation had not come. It won't come until the manifestation of Yeshua comes in the flesh. And so, uh, but when we look at this passage here, we definitely see Yahweh seated on the throne. It happens after Uzziah's death, okay? Um, Yeshayahu, Isaiah says in verse five, for my eyes have seen King Yahweh of hosts, Zabaok. And so who is king? Thinking about Yeshua. Yeshua is the king of Israel. We don't have two or three kings of Israel. We have what? One king of Israel. There's only going to be one seated on David's throne. Remember, he said, not a man uh, within David's throne. It'll never lack a man to sit on that throne. So if Yeshua is both man and Yahweh of the same nature as the Father, though distinct and separate, then he easily fulfills the bill here of king seated on the throne and king of Israel, meaning Yahweh as king, one and the same. So please remember real quickly, uh, if you go back and you study within uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, um, that there was this rejection of Yahweh as king. The people rejected Yahweh as king and wanted a human king to sit on their throne. And so what did Yahweh do? He stepped back and he gave them what they wanted. So they had a king, human kings, and look what happened. It didn't work out so well for them. Their human kings, several of them, did not work out. And so what is Yahweh going to do in the future? He's going to take the throne of David. He is going to sit on it because Yeshua is both God and man, and it will be perfection there. So yes, there will only be one king of B'nai Israel in the future. So this, he's saying, I have seen the king of Yahweh. So just keep all of that in mind. We're going to prove a little bit more of that as we go on. Um, also, when we get down here, and he's asking for someone uh, to be sent out Notice how it says, whom should I send in verse eight and who will go for us? There's definitely more than one going on here. And some people will say, well, that's just the heavenly courts. All right, because there was a heavenly court. There's no doubt about that. When we read in the Psalm, Psalm 82 and some other places, um, there is a divine court up there. But can the us also reflect the father if the person sitting on the throne right here is the messiah is the um turns out to be yeshua then that's not the father and so then when it talks about us it would also include the father um and of course when it, when it's talking about us it would be yeshua and the father who's going to go for us okay so just something to think about. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And then, of course, we get down to these passages here, which will be um, very important when we talk about Yeshua. And it says, then he said, go tell the people hear without understanding. These people hear without understanding and see without perceiving. Make the heart of this people fat, their ears heavy and their eyes blind else they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So these people here um, are going to be the ones whom Yeshayahu is being sent to. So this whole portion of chapter six is like his commissioning to go and be sent to these people. But it doesn't happen until what? After Uzziah's death. So let's go ahead and read a little bit about Uzziah. We have to go to 2 Chronicles here. We're going to read this chapter just to get a background on Uzziah. Now then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father, Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Yekoleah from Jerusalem, 
he did what was right in the eyes of Yahweh, just as his father, Amaziah, had done. He continued to seek Elohim in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the visions of Elohim. As long as he sought Yahweh, Elohim made him prosper. He went out and fought the Philistines and breached the wall of God, the wall of Yabane and the wall of Ashdod. He built cities in Ashdod and among the Philistines. Elohim helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabs who dwelt in Gerbaal and against the Minuites. The Ammonites paid tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread abroad even to the border of Mitzrayim, Egypt where he became extremely, exceedingly, I'm sorry, strong. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, the valley gate, and at the angle, and fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug out many cisterns because he had much livestock, and he had farmers in the foothills, and in the plain, and in the, vin, uh, the vine dressers, in the mountains, and in the fertile Fields, for he loved the soil. Uzziah also had a well-trained army ready to go out to battle by divisions, according to the numbers mustered by the hand of Yeel, the scribe, and Maaseah, the official, under Hananiah, one of the king's chieftains. The total number family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600, and under their command, was an army of 307,500 trained for war with mighty power to support the king against the enemy. Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and sling stones for the entire army. In Jerusalem, he made machines designed by skillful men to be used on the towers and on corners to shoot arrows and hurl large stones. So his fame spread far, for he had marvelously helped until he became strong. But when he became strong, his heart grew so haughty that he acted corruptly, for he trespassed against Yahweh, his Elohim, by entering into the temple of Yahweh to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Then Azariah, the Kohen, with 80 valiant Kohanim of Yahweh, followed him in. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to Yahweh, but for the Kohanim, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have acted unfaithfully. You will have no honor from Yahweh Elohim. Then Uzziah, who had a censer in his hand, ready to burn incense, became angry. While he was raging at the Kohanim, Zaharat broke out on his forehead right in front of the Kohanim in the house of Yahweh, beside the incense altar. When Azariah, the king, Kohen, and all, I'm sorry, the chief Kohen, and all the other Kohanim stared at him, behold, his forehead had Zara'at. So they rushed him out of there. Indeed, he himself hurried to get out because Yahweh had smitten him. So Zara'at is like uh, many call it leprosy, but it's not leprosy, but it is a form of like a flesh-eating uh, disease. Uh, we really don't have a proper English term for this disease, but just so you know, it's often in your Bibles uh, rendered as leprosy. Uh, verse 21, King Uzziah had Zerat until the day of his death. He lived in a separate house with Zerat, for he was cut off from the house of Yahweh. Yotham, his son, was in charge of the king's house and governed the people of the land. Now the rest of the acts of Uzziah from beginning to end were recorded by the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah, the son of Amaz. So Uzziah slept with his fathers and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial that belonged to the kings, where they said he had Zara'at. Then Yotham, his son, became king in his place. So we see here that he had um, a great empire for Yahweh. Um, Israel was in a very strong position here. 
and Yahweh had helped to you know establish that and then he became very prideful and he ended his life in that type of demeanor where he um, also was struck or smitten by Yahweh with Zara'at for his actions in the temple and so upon this time of his death this vision in Yeshayahu Isaiah chapter 6 comes forth so it's upon the death of this prideful king that now something new is coming forth the prophet is being stepped uh, being called to step up and he's you know basically being sent Yahweh's asking who will go for us and of course Yeshayahu says I will and he's being warned that these people are going to be very hard to reach okay very hard to reach they're in a position where they're really not hearing or listening okay and we have to understand that within the hebrew culture it's not really that they didn't hear and understand the truth but you only show yahweh that you hear and understand the truth when you are actually doing it okay so yes the people of b'nai israel understood the torah they knew how to live the torah but what this is actually saying is they're not living it correctly so they're actually really not hearing and understanding because we show Yahweh that we understand his word by how we live. If we're living it, this shows we understand it. You can't stand there and say, yes, I understand. Yes, I know exactly you know, what you're saying. And that may be true, but there's no action being done. And so in Yahweh's eyes, you're not understanding, you're not perceiving, and you're not hearing. Amen. And so this very encounter here, many people right away, hey, look, this is the father. Right, this is the father, but when we get to the time of Yeshua, he tells us it is him seated on that throne. And we'll go now to Yochanan John chapter 12. And we want to start with verse 35. Yeshua is speaking to the Parashim, and of course, they're giving him a hard time here. And so he states, therefore. Yeshua said to them, the light is with you for a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness will not overtake you. He's speaking of himself here. The one who walks in darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become sons of light. Yeshua spoke these things, then left and hid himself from them. But even though he had performed so many signs before them, they weren't trusting in him. Okay, this doesn't mean they don't see and understand. But what's the key? They weren't trusting in him. That's the key. Not trusting in someone doesn't mean that you don't admit what they're doing is correct or, you know, uh, but you're not going to follow them. You're not going to heed their words. It's not that you don't understand their words, but you're not heeding it. So trusting has to do with, okay, now I'm going to walk after you. And they're not doing that with Yeshua. So this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, who said, Yahweh, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? The arm of Yahweh? I believe this is Yeshua. Amen. The arm of Yahweh is an idiom for power, strength, okay? This is why Yeshua is seated at the right hand of Yahweh. This is all within Hebrew culture, these idiomatic forms here. And so who is the arm of Yahweh? It's Yeshua. He's the one revealing all this, okay? For this reason, they could not believe for Isaiah also said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they might not see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts and turn back and I would heal them. Okay, why is he blinding their hearts? Because they're already walking in disobedience. Okay, he's not doing it um, because, you know, they might have a chance to turn. They've already been on this road. They've already been bent the, to do um, in their hearts, what they want to do. So he, what is he doing? He's blinding their eyes. He's passing judgment on them. Amen. 
because they've already been walking in disobedience. They've already chosen that path. Now, remember, this is Isaiah chapter 6. We read it in verse 10. So the people know when Yeshua quotes a, you know, a passage, the entire chapter is in view here. The context, they're going to be thinking of the context of that entire chapter. This is Isaiah 6 here. And so then he goes on to say what? Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who's the him here? It's Yeshua. Well, they saw his glory and spoke of him. Yeshua is talking about Isaiah saw me. Nevertheless, many, even among the leaders, put their trust in him. Okay, so many did put their trust in Yeshua. But because of the perishing, they were not confessing Yeshua, so they would not be thrown out of the synagogues. For they love the glory of men more than the glory of God. So here we see that Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. That takes us right back to Isaiah chapter 6, and it says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw Yahweh seated on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, okay, so he's seeing him, right, and what does Isaiah also say here in verse 4, he says, my eyes have seen the king, Yahweh of hosts. Who's the king? Yeshua is the king of Israel. Now, what's really interesting is if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 in the Septuagint. We want to go look at it in the Septuagint. Let's see here. I want to pull up the English. That's the full Greek without the English. So just give me a second here. We'll go ahead and pull it up. All right, this is the Greek Septuagint, the Breton Septuagint translation. And it states, and it came to pass in the year which King Uzziah died, that I saw the Lord, or Yahweh, seating on a high and exalted throne, and the house was full of his glory. Amen. So the house was full of his glory. What did Isaiah see? The glory of who? Yeshua. This is Yeshua, not the Father, not the Father, okay? Remember, John chapter 12, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him, okay? Who did Isaiah think he saw? Yahweh. Who is Yeshua telling everybody who Isaiah saw? It was him, Yeshua. He saw the Messiah. He saw the one that's standing right here, the one that many leaders are putting their trust in, but they fear the perishim, so they're not confessing Yeshua. So yes, it was Yeshua seated on the throne. So when he says, who will go for us? In verse 8, obviously that's Yeshua and the Father and the heavenly courts. Who will go for us? You could easily add the father into there, amen, because it's not the father seated on the throne. And then, of course, we have verses 9 and 10, which is what is being quoted of in Yochanan, John chapter 12, okay? Go tell this people who hear without understanding, who see without perceiving, make the heart of the people fat, their ears heavy and their eyes blind, else they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Okay, we see that same phrase going on right here in verse 40. And so 
verse 40, speaking of Isaiah 6, 41 is saying, hey, he said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. So again, whose glory did he see? He saw the Lord's glory seated on high and exalted uh, throne, and the house was what? Full of his glory. The Greek Septuagint brings this out very, very clear. Amen. And so, yes, Isaiah 6 1, not the Father. It is speaking of the Messiah, Yeshua. He, he um, testifies to it. So, Yochanan, John chapter 12 is where you want to go from there. All right. So, now what I want to do also in this video is I want to look at Isaiah, Yeshiyahu, chapter 9. Chapter 9, starting with verse 5. So it says here, For to us a child is born, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, my Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and shalom, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now on until forever. The zeal of Yahweh Zabaot will accomplish this. Who do we see just there in Isaiah? He was called King Yahweh Zabaot. The Lord of hosts. Are we speaking of the same person here? I believe we are. Many people, many scholars, this is really not argued too much, uh, that this reference is a reference towards Messiah, the future Messiah. Amen. Who will what? Be seated on David's throne. Again, I got to remind you, there is only one king. Amen. There's only going to be one king over Israel, and it's going to be Yahweh himself. But now we know through progressive revelation that Yeshua is going to be that king. And yes, he is the God man. He is 100% human, 100% God. Now it says here, for to us a child is born. So of course, many people stumble over this. Well, how can God be born or created? No, we're talking Yahweh just simply coming through the birth canal. Can that happen? Can Yahweh accomplish that absolutely he can that's not beyond his capability he could come into his creation however he chooses amen he's made many manifestations as we've been seeing in this series he can step down into his creation however he chooses this is the uncreated unlimited yahweh who created everything out of nothing and so this is messiah for to us a child is born, a son will be given to us. Okay, so the son here is a position. It's the position of the Messiah. He will be, um, and I believe that he was always in that position even prior to uh, him coming. So a son will be given. He's already a son prior to his coming down. Amen. And uh, how I uh, prove that is we can go to. Romans chapter 1, Galatians chapter 4. Let's go to Romans chapter 1 real quick. All right, it says, concerning his son, speaking of Yahweh, Father Yahweh, he came into being from the seed of David. So he was the son first. And then he what came into being from the seed of David. So son first, then he became human. Amen. According to the flesh, he was appointed son of God, Ben Elohim. Amen. So this is him showing them. It wasn't that he now became the son. What is he doing? He was already the son. He had that position. We have to remember a difference in position is not a difference in nature. So now he's coming down to what? Take that inheritance that has been promised to the Messiah all throughout the scriptures, okay? The Messiah is going to be given all these things, all these promises from the Father. 
And so now he's come down to, to um, take possession of that, to receive that from the Father. He's got to come down and do the work. Amen. But he was all, always eternally in the position of his son. These are finite terms. Okay, we're speaking of the, you know, the infinite, uncreated Yahweh. And so these terms are just the best we do in English. We have the Father and we have the Son. That doesn't mean they have a different nature or essence. Okay. So in Galatians chapter 4, this is even a stronger argument. Okay, verse 4, but when the fullness of time came, God, Yahweh, sent out his son, sent him out, born of a woman and born under the law. He first was the son, and now he's being sent out to be born of a woman and born under the law. He pre-existed as the son. Then he came to be born of a woman. This is not impossible for Yahweh. Yahweh is uncreated and unlimited. If he could uh, wish this to choose to come in that fashion into the world, let it be. So be it. Amen. I'm not going to question Yahweh. He's uncreated and unlimited. He can do this. We're not talking about a finite being here who has limitations. He created everything out of nothing. Amen. So as we get back to now, let's get back to Isaiah chapter 9. So for to us a child is born, a son will be given to us, and the government will be upon his shoulder. Amen. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. So let's go ahead. In the Hebrew here, oops, we have not. I got to go to Isaiah chapter 9. I'm in Isaiah chapter 6. So hold on one second. There we go. Went to the wrong place. Must have jumped out somewhere. Isaiah chapter 9 is what I want. Okay. And I believe it's verse 6. All right. Now we got it. Okay. For a child is born to us, a son is given unto us. And the government is upon his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Here we have that word, Pile. And remember, we saw the same root form, the same, um, basically the same word in Judges chapter 13, where the angel of Yahweh tells him his name is Wonderful. And this actually comes from the word incomprehensible. Amen. So Wonderful Counselor here is showing the, the wisdom of this messiah okay and coming from the root word incomprehensible his wisdom is going to be beyond any created being well what does that point to it points to yahweh he is uncreated and infinite in his knowledge and wisdom and understanding so pile comes from that same word incomprehensible the same word that was spoken in judges 13 when the angel said his name was wonderful Amen. We have to remember that the Hebrew language is very, even beyond what oftentimes the Strong's concordances are or the, uh, uh, the um, exhaustive concordances are. Uh, Brown Driver Briggs. So these are all excellent resources. When, but what is this pointing to? Okay, he's an astonishing, astonishingly uh, wonderful a counselor. This is talking about his wisdom, and it's coming from again that same root word meaning incomprehensible. 
Okay. And it further drives home the point that this is Yahweh. When we get to the next verse, mighty God, El Gabor. So he's wonderful counselor, showing incomprehensible his knowledge, okay? The type of knowledge he has, the type of wisdom he has. Was Yeshua showing and displaying that wisdom? Absolutely. They were, they were just blown away by his wisdom and uh, how he lived the Torah and expressed the Torah, taught the Torah. And then we get into mighty God, okay? El Gabor. Now, this is something that is only spoken of, of Yahweh. We see in other places, El Gabor, Isaiah chapter 10, 21, a remnant will return even the remnant of Yaakov, Jacob, to the mighty God. In Hebrew there, it's El Gabor, speaking of Yahweh. So this is a title of Yeshua. This is a title of the Messiah. He is called Mighty God, El Gabor. Why? He's got that infinite wisdom for counsel. Amen. We also see um, El Gabor in Deuteronomy 17. I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 17. For Yahweh, your Elohim, is Elohim of Elohim. Amen. And what? Adonai of Adonai, Lord of Lords, the great, mighty, and awesome God. Okay, El Gabor is right there, who does not show partiality or take a bribe. So in Deuteronomy 10, 17. Deuteronomy 10, seventeen. Okay, we see he is the Eloah of the Elohim. Okay, he is the God of gods, and he is the Adom of Adonai, or Adomim, the Lord of Lords, and he is El Gadol, he is the great God, and he is El Gibor, the mighty God, El Gibor, mighty God, and awesome, who is not regard, who does not regard persons, nor takes a bribe. So, this El Gibor is a title of the Messiah, calling him mighty God. And then he goes on to say, my father of eternity. Now, many people stumble over this and think, well, see, it's the father, okay? We only have one father. This is just a title, okay? A title showing that Yeshua, this Messiah that's being spoken of, what is he going to be in charge of? What is he going to have all authority in? Eternal life, eternal life. Now, we know that Micah, Chapter 5 already tells us that the Messiah eternally existed. So, yes, he's going to be in charge of eternal life. He's going to have that position as a father in that position, that high-ranking position of being in charge of giving eternal life. So it says here, but you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, least among the clans of Judah, from you will come out to me one to be ruler in Israel. Okay, there it is, one to be ruler. It's going to be one king. So this will be Yahweh here. One king over Israel is Yahweh. One who's going forth are from of old, from days of eternity. He pre existed. He has no beginning. He has no end. This is speaking of Messiah. Where did Yeshua come out of? Bethlehem. Who's going to be the ruler of the kingdom? 
Yahweh is, Yeshua is, the Messiah is, who is Yahweh. Why? He's always existed. He doesn't have a beginning or an end. And so calling him, calling him eternity, you have to excuse my cats over here uh, <laughs> calling for me. Sorry about that. Making a little noise over here. She has a tendency to do that when I'm on teaching sometimes. But All right, so here we are in Isaiah 9, um, called Father of Eternity. Here, it's just the position. This is all talking of the Messiah. Who's going to be in charge of giving eternal life? Yeshua is. Yeshua is in charge. He's going to be the one seated on the judgment seat. He's going to be the one saying you're in or you're out. He's the one that's going to give eternal life. It's not the Father who's going to give it. He's handed all authority over to Yeshua to render those decisions. Amen. And so he's also called the Prince of Peace and of the government of the increase of his government and shalom, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it through justice and righteousness from now on until forever. This is all the Messiah seated on David's throne. But yet remember, Isaiah 44, there's other places too, but this is my favorite place to go to. Verse 6, thus says Yahweh, Israel's king and his redeemer. Yahweh of hosts, Zavaot, king and redeemer. What did we see over there in Isaiah? King Yahweh, Zavaot, who's seated on the throne? Yeshua seated on the throne. This is Yeshua. I am the first and the last. There is no God besides me. Speaking of his nature, right, Yeshua has the same nature as the Father, there is one Yahweh, and within the one nature, essence of the Father, is Father, Son, and Ruach HaKodesh, and each one is 100% Yahweh. And again, we get this all the time, oh, that doesn't make sense, you know, that's not human logic, we're speaking of Yahweh. I am just showing you what the scriptures say, and it's showing that terminology is fact in the scriptures. We don't have to know the details. We don't have to work out all the minute, well, how can that be? He's infinite, uncreated. That's where the stumbling block occurs, is the finite being wants to figure out the fullness of the infinite. But remember, if the finite could ever fully explain the infinite, the infinite is no longer infinite. And so, sorry, I'm going to believe it to be true, because scripture says it and the work of Yeshua says it. The two witnesses are right there. Scripture declares it. The work of Yeshua declares it. It is so. It is so. Amen. So I hope this was helpful to you. I wanted to go ahead in this teaching here and end with the ironic blessing. Please go over this passage, these passages again. Go over this teaching uh, several times. You will see the truth in it that Yeshua is Yahweh. He is of that same nature as the Father, though distinct and separate from. Amen. Amen. So we'll go ahead and say the blessing in Hebrew first, and then we'll say it in English. If you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. You find it in Bamidbar, the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. Amen. For those of you who can't see the screen. Yevarechecha Adonai ve'ish merecha. Ya er Adonai pa anav elacha veyunika. Yesa Adonai pa anav elacha veyasem lacha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine to you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Shalom, everyone.